Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overall Series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3. In this episode I'm going to begin with satisfying the successful re-entry contract. So we're just trying to launch an uncrewed vehicle up into orbit and then have it come back down safely. And to that end I've created a very small probe but before we get to that let's just take a look at what we need to handle. We're going to unlock Hydrolox engines in 28 days. Um, it says Hydrolox engines. I hope it's something a little bit more advanced. We do have Hydrolox engines already, so I hope they're somewhat more advanced Hydrolox engines. Anyway, so then we the next thing that we would have to do is fill this contract for successful reentry within 255 days. And then we've got some maneuver nodes to handle for our Jupiter probes. And uh, that uh, the Jupiter flyby contract is... Um, 1,122 days. But I note this Jovian one is swinging by in a very long period of time. 1,794 days before it actually has its encounter. Is that right? Um, maybe it's prudent to uh, take a look at that before I discuss this. Actually, we've got quite a nifty bunch of stuff going on in general. I, uh, this isn't even debris. This is just probes that I've launched. I don't have debris selected, but take a look at all the orbits that we've done in this series and stages that are still sort of hanging out. That's just the Earth area. And But take a look at the interplanetary space because a lot of stuff has been kicked out. We've, we've done interplanetary transfers. Not as many as this though. Um, some of them have just been kicked out by the moon or stuff like that. Yeah, but clearly we have a Jupiter Orbiter, Jovi Jovian 1, and then... Oh, okay, there's another Jovian 1. So let's see. Um, our naming isn't particularly great for determining exactly what's going on here. Okay, this one has a maneuver in 281 days. Uh, oh, that maneuver is a dummy maneuver. I wonder why we didn't have the Jupiter encounter in the... That's sort of important. Let's make sure we add the SOI change. Yeah, that's that was what was confusing me because this one wouldn't fulfill the contract, so that would have obviously been bad. We do not want to fail another contract, do we? Okay, so that's settled, and there's this Jupiter orbiter, which will be coming in in a year and 162 days. That's that one right there. That one really does have a maneuver, and then following that, we've got this Jupiter. Uh, this uh, Jovian one that's actually headed for Saturn. Um, nope, by... wait. What is it doing? It looks like it's headed for... Oh, oh, I see what's going on here. Okay, so this is... This might be a mistake, this particular SOI change. I think this SOI change is indicating the Jupiter encounter. Mm, is that the right number of days? Now, eight years would be more than that. Okay, this is indicating a Saturn encounter. No, it says new SOI Jupiter. Uh, but 365 days per year and eight years indicates that that should be at least 2,400 days. So, yeah. Something wrong there. This is just uh, another stage. We don't need to pay attention to that. I I don't know. I don't know which SOI this is going for. I hope it's going to hit Saturn. But I don't know when. Well, I mean, four years. Four years and 299 days seems like about that number. Okay, we'll hope it's headed for Saturn. Okay, so I've called this the quickie, even though it seems to take 5 days and 20 hours to build, which is more than I thought it would. But the probe is actually just this. So that's that's it. It's got um, early controllable core there. It's less than the 0.2 tons that that core can handle. It's got little hydrazine thrusters, 45 newtons. See, they're configured to hydrazine. Because why have two propellants at this point when you're a tiny little probe like this? It's got these little fastest solar panels, which were the smallest ones I could find. I don't have tweak scale in this, so uh, these were the only ones that I could possibly fit on here. Uh, it's got a parachute, of course, uh, a stack double. It's got 
RCS thrusters on top two, um, just for controlling uh, orientation properly. That's a hydrazine tank, and a single antenna on top. And of course, the heat shield, which is lunar rated, in fact, because it was actually the only, well, it was the cheapest one to unlock anyway, so there's no point trying to get a lesser heat shield. Um, the next stage is an AJ-10 118E. It is currently burning for four minutes and that starts off with a thrust to weight ratio of 0.92. Four minutes is well under its rated burn time. I think it's more than six minutes rated burn time. And um, we've got uh, Able Avionics package there which can more than handle this. Uh, we've got a Thor Avionics unit here and then the base engine is a single LR89. I decided not to use the H1 because it's more expensive. We went with really cheap engines. The Astros engine could have worked for the upper stage. I guess I was going for a Delta sort of upper stage, but the Astros engine would have been just fine and we might move to it later. Let's take a look at the relative costs. AJ-10 118E is $250. Astros is 300 so it's not a big difference but uh, the efficiency is very different it's 278 for the AJ-10 and that's even with this upgrade while it's uh, 297 uh, well possible 310 for the Astros 2 so yeah uh, really I should have used the Astros in fact uh, I've talked myself into it already let me just uh, use the Astros who cares about it being a Delta stage when, I mean, boy, uh, yeah, I don't know about this Asterisk engine. It seems like it's OP. It's too obvious that you have to use it. So we'll go like this. It'll be a little bit more legit, I guess. Costs 50 credits more, but we probably saved some on the tankage mass and all. Okay. The LR-89, uh, let me uh, just go over the logic behind that. Here we see it's 750 funds, whereas the H1 is 1,750 funds. And if you recall earlier in the series, we used a lot of LR-89s. We, I've used LR-89s a lot before, and the reason is because they are obviously cheaper and obviously better. We were using them all the way up till we got the Proton engines and then the NK engines, of course. The Proton engines are very nice, and the NK-15s are even nicer. But this will do, a single one of those. We've got fins for roll control. I've limited them to, uh, to 5 degrees of controllability, control surface deflection. And let's see how this goes. Mm. I think I've pressed a button that has sort of caused this to all... Ah, I clicked on it and it, it turned into seconds. That's clever. So if you want it all in seconds, I don't know why, but if you do, you can do that. So we've, we've uh, so far covered 645 million seconds in this series, just in case you were wondering. Okay, here we go. SAS on, throttle is up, and ignition, and launch. Off we go with the quickie. Incidentally, uh, half of the cost was the probe itself. It's about 2,200 for the probe, and then 2,200 for the rocket. Okay, we're past the speed of sound, doing well. So we really need to be flat as the g-forces are building up here. Obviously I allowed for the high g-forces mainly because I didn't want to put another stage in. Because that costs more. Fairing separation? Okay, and separation of, well the second stage we shouldn't lie at the same time because obviously the fuel is not sold right now. Let's separate. Okay, RCS forward. Uh-oh. Um, K-1 
can be fed by the, that tank? Uh, I don't know. Uh, the propellant is remaining unstable. Oh, the engine's okay? Very stable. All right. Oh, okay. We're, we're actually good. Who knew? Maybe I actually made it a service module engine like I should, but boy, it took a while for these little thrusters to stabilize it. I mean, yeah, they're angled a little bit, but they should have been fine to uh, sell the fuel down. The solar panels can't uh, power this unless it's uh, in standby mode. Right now it's using 50 watts, each panel produces 3 watts, so and we can't angle all of them at the sun at the same time, but when it's time warping, it goes into low power mode and then it only requires 1 watt, so a 3 watt panel can handle it, so as long as one is facing the sun, uh, it can be recharged. What we really need it for, I have no idea. We do have scientific instruments aboard, but just the small ones. So if I press 2, well, we've done that already, done that already, done, done. So, no surprises there. This has some electric charge in. That's good. I, may, I, I don't know if there's a chance we can deorbit this. It has an internal omni range. All we have to do is recover craft from orbit. Um, it seems satisfied. In fact, uh, I, I guess we don't even need to get to orbit for this contract because it's... Uh, I don't know... Wow. Congratulations to the craft and survivory entry. The engineers are examining it. Um, what? What did that? I don't know what survived re-entry that they thought it's already fulfilled. Did I have like some piece of debris to actually... But then stage recovery would have known that. There's something messed up with this contract. This contract, uh, something was messed up with it. Now we're not going to get anything for doing this. That's annoying. Well, I guess we'll test this little guy. I'm going to, um, nah, let's see if it can independently deorbit itself. Okay, that's a good orbit. See if we can do that with this. Alright, um, separation. Okay, to this other side, um, yeah, retrograde. doesn't have that much power only like a few minutes kind of thing well that's it it has ensured its own re-entry now this little guy has to do it too and yeah we might as well just arm the parachute Okay, that should be good enough. Let us now go surface negative relative velocity. We'll probably lose communication. The, I'm relying that the parachutes are armed, that they have pressure pre-deployment and everything. So it should be all right. And Smart ASS will be tasked to hold its orientation. I wonder if it'll flip around. The heat shield should be fairly heavy. But the parachute might also be heavy. All this thruster firing is actually bringing our periapsis up. Because of the placement on of those. I mean, I originally said for periapsis in the mid 60 kilometer range. Now it's at 83 kilometers. And our apoapsis hasn't exactly come down either. Okay, well now at least numbers appear to be dropping. We have no connection. 
it's still going around somewhere. I mean, if we take a look at the surface velocity, it's sort of going around it. Not quite hitting it. Okay, well, we are under 100 kilometers in altitude, and the numbers are looking a lot better now. Not so worried about how they were going up earlier. They are definitely now in suborbital range. Well, we're at 75 kilometers, and I think the atmosphere is forcing us close to, closer to the retrograde vector. Hopefully it'll hold there. No flipping around or anything. Um, we seem to have some redness on the parachute pack. That doesn't seem like a good thing. I hope it's going to be alright. Well, there's flame effects, but this shouldn't be getting red at all. I sort of made this caps capsule shaped. I wanted it to be capsule shaped in the hope that that would, you know, keep things safe behind the heat shield. Well, max G load was 7.75, which is still better than some people have had it. We still have no communication, so I'm not touching anything. Not messing around with smart ASS. I'll just let it do whatever it does. Well, that's one heck of a tiny drogue shoot right there. Really? That's that's a that's a tiny tiny drogue shoot. I hope the shoots were sized properly. I did apply settings. Okay, well those look a little bit better. The triple main shoot does seem to be a little bit more properly shaped, but we'll have to see. Let's hope it doesn't mess with us. Okay, main shoots bring us to um, 7.2 meters per second. That's not bad. Ooh. Okay, wow. Um, even with the good velocity, it almost looked like it had perished there. But let's recover before it does. Okay, no science earned. No, no science earned. Uh, 211 funds recovered. Um, that's because it was so far away. Only 11.1% of the value was recovered. Remember, it was a 2,200 fund probe. So I don't know if we got much out of that, but uh, the contract seemed to be satisfied way before I thought it ought to be. I think the next thing to do is to wait until the Hydrolox engines are complete and then build something to test all of our new engines. We have the upgrades to the NK-15, so now they're NK-33s and 43s and 31s, and uh, hopefully we'll have advanced RL-10s. So let's see what we can do with that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to see what this stuff can really do. Uh, here we have a rocket. Uh, well, it is the Nico 2545, not 2544 anymore. Uh, and that is because we've added an extra engine to the third stage, obviously. That's how we do this. And it's a central engine, so if we... Uh, oh, wait. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's coming later. Hold on. There we go. Uh, so we've got an extra NK39, not the 31. So the outer four gimbal... And the center one is an NK39, which doesn't gimbal, but does throttle. Uh, not that I especially feel a need to have it throttle, actually, because you can see our max thrust weight ratio is 1.46 with the RL10 stage on top. But, yeah, uh, it can throttle, so we have that capability for one of the engines anyway. Uh, up here, we have nine RL-10s, and that's because after researching those Hydrolox engines, all they did was give us one, one upgrade for the RL-10. The RL-10A-3-3. It has a bit better ISP, but not really a better burn time. And so, yeah, uh, because it doesn't have a better burn time, uh, we need more of them to make use of the greater capacity of the launcher. The launcher hasn't uh, increased capacity, capacity by that much. 
especially since we're uh, we want some extra thrust to weight ratio in order to make sure we don't have problems if an engine goes out. But you can see, I mean, the booster setup in the first stage is basically the same as it was, but we'll probably have less likelihood of engine failure now because the burn times are longer, the rate of burn times are longer. Um, but yeah, three minutes, three minutes, uh, three minutes for the first stage, three minutes for the second stage. It's not really showing the boosters separately right now. And then six minutes for third stage, which is right at the limit of what I accept, which is a 12 minute to orbit system. Um, and then we have a transfer stage to the moon. And what we're transferring to the moon is the Tugmaster 5000. Uh, this is, uh, it, it's a larger version of the uh, Tug Alpha, which did work. And so I decided to just scale up something that did work. And I scaled it up by putting a total of 16 of the advanced Gemini lander engines at the bottom uh, to give us a healthy amount of possible thrust. They do throttle, so that's okay. And uh, service module tank. And of course we have the advanced, uh, no, no, the Apollo docking system at the bottom and the propellant only docking system at the top. It's a Thor avionics unit. We've got electric charge here. And yep, that's basically the idea. So it's just a big tank that's not called a fuel depot, right? Very important. And a lot of extra RCS thrusters just in case, because I want to, it to be able to maneuver its 50 tons. But it's uh, Tugmaster 5000 because it's a 50 ton tank. So if this can launch uh, that Tugmaster to the moon without using any of the Tugmaster's fuel, then this launcher will exceed the capacity of, of the Saturn V to launch to the moon. And its mass is only 2,767, so it will be more efficient overall than the Saturn V. Partly that's because, of course, the NK-15s are more efficient than the, than the F-1s. And we've got a lot of uh, NK-15s. Uh, of course, the Saturn V second stage is J2s, so it catches up with our efficiency a little bit there. But then we beat it out again with our transfer stage to the moon, which is RL10s, which are more efficient than the J2s, so and also lighter. We are carrying the Saturn instrument unit here, and that's uh, that's a heavy mass to be carrying this high up on the rocket. Then. Uh, it actually determined the size of the 2545. You can see we've made uh, the stages wider. It used to be that we had the S4 stage, which was 5 meters in, in diameter, and we ended up having a 6.6 .6 meter diameter stage because of the Saturn instrumentation unit. The reason I chose it was because I didn't want to carry a bunch of these around, and we would need at least two, and that's four tons, whereas a single Saturn, oops, single Saturn instrument unit is only two tons, and it can carry twenty thousand tons worth. Of, uh, can deal with twenty thousand tons. It only has a electric charge consumption of two hundred fifty watts compared to five hundred watts for a Saturn one instrument unit, and then for a Thor avionics unit is three hundred watts. So it's pretty good there as well. But again, we are carrying extra mass for an extended period of time. So that's the not good part. Yeah. We'll, I'll have to think about whether to keep it up here or to move it down and have like a Saturn 1 instrument unit up here. Uh, well, but at two tons, that's not a good idea. Okay, well, that, that's the issue, right? Then you have the Thor avionics unit. And if you remember, the Thor avionics unit causes, causes things to wobble, and I don't want things to wobble. So, yeah. We, the only one we have is up there right now. Okay, we do have little uh, procedural tanks with electric charge, Arizine and N204 on the S4, uh, not the S4 stage anymore. This is, I don't know what to call it, the 9RL10 stage. Um, mm, we'll think of something. Okay, so that stage will need to be named. Everything else is part of the Nico rocket. Expensive launch, obviously. And we'll see. We'll be able to see how much uh, this launcher can get into orbit. If it can get uh, the RL-10 stage to orbit without using any of its fuel, then that's 125 tons to orbit. 
Um, if we have to use some of the fuel, then obviously it won't be 125 tons to orbit. We will see. Obviously, we could have a wider fairing if we wanted one, but I didn't want one this time because uh, that means a larger fairing base, and that's a heavier fairing base. Okay, aiming to beat Saturn V's numbers, at least to the moon, uh, which I believe Saturn V had 48 tons. We're trying to launch 50 tons. We'll see how it goes. Okay... It's very sticky. It's a big rocket. We've gone from like a tiny, tiny rocket to a humongous rocket. And I think my computer prefers the tiny one. Yep. Physics has kicked in safely. SAS on. Throttle is up. Okay, well it's a nighttime launch. Here we go. Ignition. And launch. Oh, yeah, audio is not really able to keep up with all this stuff, apparently. Well, let's see how well these engines perform. They're sure gonna accumulate data units. Actually we need to accumulate more data units on the RL-10s now that we've upgraded them. We're, it looks like we're starting out with 4,921. Okay, we are going through max Q right now. Everything is looking good. Made it into the launch. We should probably simulate a crude launch, so at 3 G's we'll start throttling down. We can, because the burn times have been extended. Okay, engine out, and set. Some residual kerosene on the boosters, by the way. Um, well, at least the booster is separated cleanly, but not quite your normal Korolev cross. It is more of a Tyler Ray's horizontal separation where they don't fling out. That happens a lot to me. We could potentially add recovery stuff to this and the boosters. The boosters being pointy doesn't really afford too many places to put the floats, for instance. We'll look into it, though. Okay, again, extra kerosene set. And ignition. I, I would like to check how much extra kerosene there was in there, but I'm not gonna. Let me separate off the fairing. That's pretty darn tight right there. Well, we're ending up a little bit higher than I strictly would have liked, I guess. That's partly because none of the engines failed so far. Okay, separation. And ignition. Four NK-31s and one NK-39. Come on. Okay. Lots of lag. Well, as far as trying to get the 125 ton number into orbit, it's going to be a bit tight. Well, we are past apoapsis now. I don't want to pitch up too much right now. We'll see how it goes. Well, I'm trying to finish this off on a, on a positive note as far as the vertical speed is concerned, but it's going to be close. It's sure looking like we're going to need to use the RL-10s for a bit. But this will re-enter and not be space junk. Okay, set. 
Okay, ignition. And now we have nine RL10s working at it. And that's a good orbit. 122 tons to orbit, we'll say. It's pretty close. Uh, trajectory optimization could help, but it's not going to be too much more. It's somewhere between 120 and 125 tons that we could say the launcher can handle. At this point, I'll lock the fuel up here so that we only use the RCS from down in these little red pods. That's what it is. Okay, now let me plot for the moon. Okay, the plot has been made. It will require 3,160 meters per second, and we have 3,061. So, yeah. Uh, the capacity to the moon, not quite 50 tons. It might match Saturn V, uh, which had 45 to 48 tons, but uh, not quite there. Not quite the 50 tons. But that's alright, it's better off if we finish off the burn with the payload anyway. It'll be more precise. We do have boil off, that's, uh, that's a fact. The liquid hydrogen is boiling off. But to avoid that we would probably need like a service module tank. And in that case it'll just be heavier. We could carry a little bit of extra liquid oxygen to compensate. That might have gotten us some extra delta V. You never know when you're going to want to dock one of these 9 RL10 stages to say a Mars payload. That can happen. In that case we'll probably make them service module tanks instead of just cryogenic. Okay, here we go. Nine RL-10s. Well, I'm sure somebody has uh, dared me to do something like this. Um, put a whole bunch of them on the stage. Well, here we are. Okay, getting ready for the end of this stage. No engine failures. And there it is. Okay, separation, and ignition. I did obviously unlock the fuels first. Sixteen of these advanced Gemini lander engines. Um, we don't really need to be that close. It's better to be in a higher standby orbit both for communications and also so that we can correct inclination for whatever actually needs to be tugged. We don't know what needs to be tugged right now, right? Okay, so it's on its way to the moon. Let's do this thing. Let's make sure solar panels are out. So once again, as long as I don't call it a fuel depot, it tends to work rather well. This is the approach. And right now we're at a 14 degree inclination. I think that's fine. We'll make a loose orbit so that we can mess with the inclination at some other time. But whatever has an emergency will have to be going around this way. Not on a free return trajectory. So that's the caveat. The little lander engines do not gimbal, so the RCS has to do some work here. Okay, we've captured. We're in a high orbit around the moon. Didn't take too much. I don't want too long an orbital period. I think one day will be fine. Uh, maybe 12 hours is... Uh, no, no, one day is fine. Let's stop it there. We've gotten 44 tons in orbit. Probably uh, on a tighter orbit, maybe 40 tons. So not bad. Not bad at all. Okay, and since it'll be getting light you know, for most of the orbit, all of this part. You don't have to worry about the electric charge, really. So there we have it. A successful mission delivering this tug to the moon. Let's just turn off the RCS now. Um, yeah, I'll just spin around. 
I think I'll leave it there. It took a while to figure out the numbers for the rocket and what exactly I could get away with. I, I overestimated just a little bit uh, in order to ensure that we would run out of the prior stages and get the real numbers. Otherwise, uh, if you have a little bit of fuel uh, left over in like the third stage or the RL-10 stage, you don't know for sure uh, how much it could have really carried. But this way, we, we've got a pretty good idea about the limits of the Nico 2545. All right, so thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.